Hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. I'm Prashant with me, my colleagues Reema and Nigel. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, TGIF, good morning. as they say, right? Thank God it's yes. Friday. Yes. And, uh, you know, we look forward to another uh, decent session. Uh, so, it's continuation of where, where we left off in trade yesterday in more ways than one. And I'll tell you why. Uh, you have a situation where uh, the U.S. 10-year continues to fall. Uh, there is market interest rates in the U.S., the two-year, 10-year, I mean, all across the curve. Uh, the 10-year, for example, was down nine and, another 9.5 basis points. It's at about 3.5% now. Uh, and, you know, this comes on the back of the fall we saw day before. Dollar index, that also uh, fell. It's now under 105. Uh, we left off at about 106 or so. So that's pretty sharp uh, fall in, the, in two days flat. Uh, and, uh, you know, U.S. data was disappointing, which in a way was uh, sort of good news because markets liked it. Most important data point is later today, which is the jobs number, and we'll talk more about that uh, a little later. I mean, if that number comes through uh, in, a, in a very weak fashion as compared to what the expectation is, I mean, uh, that will uh, sort of, you know, light up some fireworks uh, for sure. SGX Nifty is indicating a flattish kind of start, down some, what, uh, 50, 60 odd points, 18,918 a third of a percent lower. Reema, hi. Nigel, hi. Hi. Uh, yesterday was just a kind of a session of consolidation, right? Investors pausing on Wall Street. So by the end of it, the Dow was down about a half a percent, but the S&P 500 flat, the Nasdaq was up 0.1 percent. Some of the investors were perhaps questioning, did we get ahead of ourselves with that Wednesday's monster rally? Because as Prashant pointed out, we've got a very important data point awaited, the jobs data. The ISM manufacturing data was a subdued. ISM manufacturing data showed the first contraction since May 2020, and that's also an important economic indicator. So, the, you know, the mood on Wall Street changed to some extent. On Wednesday, it was exuberant, but yesterday, there was just a bit of caution, some pause, some consolidation that we saw. The U.S. 10-year bond deal now stands at levels of 3.52%, which 54% now, which compares with yesterday's level of 3.63%. The dollar index is eased to a level below 105. Very smart buying seen by the FIs yesterday, right? The FIs bought 2,600 crore in the cash. Uh, sorry, there was a DII buying, while the FIs sold about 1,500 crore. So some reversal. Yeah, well, I mean, we had that large, very large number, right? Net yeah. flow number on. Uh, so I mean, maybe some uh, reversal, but. Uh, the, the point is that market sentiment, especially in the U.S., just to set things up, remains very, very positive. Uh, and when market sentiment is positive, it is usually a dollar negative, right? I mean, I'm talking about risky assets higher and, uh, uh, you know, the risk-free dollar lower. And that is essentially what is happening right now. Uh, this is out of the U.S. Now, U.S. economic data disappointed. This is good news. ISM manufacturing, for example, the PCE number, that was weaker. So bad is good. Uh, and in the sense that, I mean, weaker data means lower hikes, etc. So that's good news. Uh, Treasury yields fell. The 10-year fell uh, 9.5 basis points. The dollar index is down 105. Uh, the most important number, as I said, is the jobs number. The consensus expects about 200,000. Uh, and here's an interesting a bit of uh, trivia. Over the last uh, 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 several meetings, actually throughout the course of this year, actual numbers, actual jobs data... Uh, has uh, been about 26% higher than the consensus. So more often than not, I mean, in terms of the number of meetings, there have been only two instances where, you know, the number has been weaker than consensus expectations. But things change. I mean, that's the nature of markets, that's the nature of data, and it's possible uh, that the cumulative effect of all that we've been seeing out there starts to weigh in. So, uh, you know, you want to get to a position where the Fed feels that what it is doing is working in terms of slowing the economy, uh, bring, bringing down aggregate demand and things like that. And what they've put the most amount of emphasis on is the labor, labor market data uh, and hourly earnings, etc. So that's a, and that data usually comes right at the word go, right at the beginning of the U.S. trading session. So we'll keep an eye. On the back of what we've seen in both yields, which are lower, and the dollar, which is lower, uh, there are two sectors which were in focus yesterday, the IT services index, uh, and that's a big one uh, for the market as well. IT was, of course, the top performing index, mid cap and large cap, everything between two and six percent, depending on what you want to look at. And they remain well positioned because of this macro tailwind. We don't know company specific. And I think, you know, it's possible that all the way till the result season, which is only in January, you have a bit of a run. Uh, if uh, these trends remain, I mean, the interest rates, market interest rates remain lower under pressure. And of course, metals is the other pack. Yesterday, again, that was another pack, uh, which both steel and non-steel did well. Dollar lower is positive for commodities. Uh, so that's another one uh, to watch out for. Broader markets are participating, stock-specific, small single stocks, mid-caps, small caps, etc. 
So I think that is, and we'll talk more about, you know, what has been in momentum. Uh, Mid-cap index, by the way, is up some 2% this week, a little over 2%. The Nifty is up one and a half. So it started to pull, uh, sort of pull ahead, uh, even dis despite the recent occasional pullbacks. Uh, on the Nifty, I mean, keep a trailing stop loss at about 18,700. I mean, the stop has got to keep coming up as the market moves higher. That's the point. So we've brought it closer. We're at about 18,800 or so. The, in, the opening indicates a lower start. Maybe that changes a little bit, uh, as we've seen so often over the next 60 minutes by the time we reach there. Uh, but uh, be mindful. If you're trading, I think always important uh, not to get uh, sucked into the euphoria. The, we, we're building up into a bit of a euphoric kind of moment where the market's been doing very well. If you're trading, you need to be watchful uh, not to lose money as well. Nigel, what are you watching on? For? Well, yesterday, actually, the final tick of the Nifty was at the day's low. Yeah. It was weekly expiry that played out. And in fact, we ended closer to around the 18,800 odd mark. But because of averaging, well, that number looks a little bit better. The Nifty Bank, well, that didn't participate yesterday. But for me, the biggest positive was the broader markets participated. And I'd like to see more of the same because that's what helps portfolios as well. So you had the small cap index and the mid cap index. They did reasonably well. You had the advanced decline numbers that got a little bit closer, but still, we ended on a positive note. Now, what did the FIs do in the FNO market? Yes, they unwound some longs, they unwound some shorts as well. But the clients, right, we have been tracking their positioning as well. And yesterday, they added more longs than shorts, which is good news. But they continue to remain net short on the index, mildly so, 48% of their positions on the long side. While the FIs, they stay net long out there. What about the options data? Now, we're starting off a new series, new weekly series. So, I was looking at the options data. The highest open interest on the call side is at around the 19,000 call. On the put side is at around 18,800 put. And yesterday, you had a fair bit of writing at the 18,800 call, at the 19,000 call, as well as the 18,800 put. So, just take a look at that. You know, that's the premium out there. And the 18,800 call, the premium was around 150 to around 200 rupees. So those writers, well, they are hoping for that 18,950 odd level holding out. But the Nifty Bank, you know, that's, that maybe can move a percent or so higher from here. But then it seems that some part of the street is positioning themselves that we run into resistance at around that 43,700, 43,800 odd. I say that because there was a big surge in open interest yesterday at around that 43, uh, 43,500 call. And it should run into resistance at around those levels. So just keep an eye out. Normally, we don't see very, very active options um, in the Nifty Bank, but that was one observation yesterday, which brings us to the Nifty levels. Resistance will be at around the 18,950 to around 19,000, going by the call writing that we've seen at around that 18,800 call as well as the 19,000 call, while support at around 18,700 put. And I say that because the premium at the 18,800 put is around 100 rupees. Subtract that and you'll get your stop loss. The dip will have to get bought into, uh, you know, 70 points low is what the SGX Nifty suggests. I think closer to around 18,700, that would be a good entry point. Reema, what else? Well, uh, some wise men opinion then. We've got Sanjay Mukim of JP Morgan who says MSCI India's meager returns in 2022, despite large EPS cuts, mean that markets start 2023 with still elevated valuations. He says India's structural promise remains a significant long-term attraction, but the economy can feel pressures from slowing global growth in the near term. He expects another year of no index returns as earnings grow into valuation. He says financials are likely to sustain momentum and they remain overweight on staples as potential beneficiaries of the upcoming election cycle. He says JP Morgan is underweight on IT and the non-auto consumer discretionary as demand slows. Okay, some money market views. This is Bhaskar Panda of HDFC Bank who says a spade of positive factors were responsible for the dollar INR moving downwards like soft oil prices, comments suggesting lower pace of rate hikes in US. Consequently, the dollar index closing below the 200-day moving average yesterday and the Indian economy doing better than others. He expects the dollar INR pair to consolidate around 81 pivot and trade in a range of between 81 to 81.2 to a dollar for the day. On bonds, Bhaskar Panda says the Indian bond yields have been softening, taking into account global queues and expecting softer inflation at home as well. He expects the 10-year benchmark bond yield to trade in a range of 7.2 to 7.25% today with a downward buy still intact. Well, we've got plenty of stocks to track for you in terms of stock-specific action. We'll get to that in just a bit in our special Top 10 segment where we're looking at Hero Motor Corp, West Life Food, Yes Bank, Paytm, ONGC, Oil India, Reliance. Those are stocks in the back of positive news flow. While on the flip side, 
Here are Vaishu Motors, PB Fintech and NBC. They are stocks that could react to some negative news flow. Okay, so lots to track and it's an interesting session uh, that uh, we are looking ahead to. Jahangir Aziz is now joining us. He's Managing Director, Head of Emerging Markets Economics Research at J.P. Morgan. Jahangir, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, you know, the, uh, is this the finally the, uh, the, the pivot party moment? Jahangir, are we finally there after sort of trying to call it all year through? Are we, are we close, to, close to it now as we end this year? What's your sense? Look, I mean, all that Powell did was to remove the extreme risks that the market had that he could go far more aggressively than what he had said in November. If you read, if you listen to him carefully, he he talked about the stepping down, and that was already always in the price. Uh, but he insisted that this would be, you know, a long haul. So I think that the, that the market is forgetting that the terminal rate is going to be significantly higher than what we had in mind, let's say, back in November or beyond that. Uh, and that, you know, it is going to be there for a very long period of time. Um, I think the risk that they go way too aggressively, I think more or less that has been taken out. But I don't think that uh, there is any pivot as yet. Uh, you will get a step down, and then you will continue to see the Fed uh, raising rates. Till they reach the terminal rate, which is probably at five or higher than five, sometime in the first quarter of 23. That's fine. Uh, but, but Jahangir, the point is, as you said, if they did not raise any fresh alarm about uh, inflation, right? New alarm. I mean, and that's what the market really is yeah. bothered about. Uh, isn't that at the margin good news? And uh, will the market it keep responding uh, to this? Yeah, go on. No, no, oh, okay, no, of course it's good news. Look, mm. there is a disinflation process underway. Mm. There is a very large disinflation process underway. Uh, but that disinflation doesn't take you to the 2%, two, 2.5% two uh, comfort zone. Uh, that disinflation stalls sometime uh, at around 3 3 3.5% or even, even before that. And I think that the first part of that disinflation is easy. And that's what is happening right now. So there is no question that a disinflation is taking place. The question is, is the rate hike sufficient to take the disinflation process beyond the 4 or 5% to the 2 to 2.5%? And that's where the biggest doubts are, because you haven't seen that kind of support coming from the labor market. Uh, as you spoke about, you know, at the introduction, uh, you know, to, today we'll, we'll get to hear, get to see what the labor market is doing. Uh, and if you look at what is happening to inflation, goods inflation is coming down, uh, food prices are coming down, energy prices are coming down. Uh, but, you know, uh, service inflation, that's keeping on rising. And that's where the wage growth uh, pressures are going to be felt. Mm. Uh, Jahangir, morning. Rima here. The current consensus is that yep. the terminal rate in the U.S. is going to be around 5% and we'll hit it sometime in the first half of next year. What is the risk that the terminal rate actually turns out to be a lot higher than what the market is anticipating? Do you think what, according to you, is the probability of that? Um, are we undervaluing the risk right now of this higher for longer? So we put out a global outlook uh, around Thanksgiving, so about you know, a week, 10 days back. And that was one of the scenarios that we were looking at. Uh, you know, we have a probability of about 28%, uh, but it's a scenario where uh, you know, the Fed reaches that five, five and a quarter level by the first quarter of 23 and then goes in for a pause, uh, hoping that the lags of monetary tightening will start, you know, having its effect. Uh, and our concern is that maybe inflation is so entrenched and the labor market does not break soon enough so that uh, that additional disinflation that is required to take it down to, you know, comfort levels of two, three percent. That doesn't happen, and the Fed is forced to re start rehiking aggressively in the second half of the year. Uh, and we have about a 25% odd probability to that scenario. So yeah, I mean there is a, there is a scenario out there where it things work out this way, but not that you know the terminal rate keeps on going. The terminal rate is taken to five five and a quarter. You go for a pause, and then you're forced to rehike. Mm. Hi, Jangir. Good morning. Uh, you know, the last time we chatted, we were wondering whether or not the dollar index has peaked out. Uh, it's corrected yep. substantially from around that 115 to sub-105 odd. 
Now, do you believe that yep. that 115 is a bit of a peak? And more importantly, what does it mean for the Indian rupee? Because that as well had moved to around 83 odd, but that's pulled back a little bit. So, trajectory on the currency space? So again, you know, the rupee is clearly benefiting from the fact that dollar has weakened and the dollar has weakened over the last two, three weeks, largely because of the shift in market sentiment towards how much rate hikes will be there. Uh, as I said, you know, that, you know, uh, we'll have to wait and see where the terminal rate goes and where, you know, what happens to European growth uh, in, 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 the, in, first in, the in the fourth quarter and the first quarter. Right now, uh, all the fears that we have about European growth going down and going into a massive recession, the recession fear is still there, but it's much shallower. And I think it is these two things that is weakening the dollar and strengthening, strengthening the euro at this point in time. Uh, in terms of, you know, what it does to the rupee, I think, you know, it obviously will get some relief because the dollar is weakened, and there's no doubt about that. But rupee's problem has, you know, very little to do with the dollar. Rupee's problem has to do with the fact that India is running a very large current account deficit is running a very large fiscal deficit. It has inflation still around six, seven percent, and it is providing almost no compensation for that macro risk. Uh, so I know that you keep talking about, you know, how the FIs haven't moved in either in the equity or in the bond space, but there's a reason why the FIs have moved in, haven't moved in. There is a massive macro risk on India, and there is very little compensation either in the high equity valuation or in the high bond valuation or on the high FX valuation. All right. Uh, Jangir, if you could give us a couple of numbers on inflation. What are you working with for India as well as uh, the current account deficit? So the current account deficit we're working around is, look, we had only one quarter of this fiscal year, which was around 2.8%. We think that the current run rate is about four and a half, four to four and a half percent. We think for the year as a whole, we'll end up around three and a half percent. Uh, that sort of is the current account. Uh, I think, you know, inflation will probably get into the sixth handle and probably into the upper five handle in, in next year. Uh, but, you know, the disinflation process in India is going to be very different from the disinfl disinflation process elsewhere in emerging markets and globally because the inflation over there was much stronger. Uh, and so while in the first quarter of 23, we expect emerging markets in general to see almost a 200 to 250 basis points drop in inflation. I think that is unlikely to be the case in India. India is going to be much slower disinflation uh, taking place. Uh, so those are the numbers that we are working with. Uh, but really the key number that we are working with is the amount of um, current account deficit. Mm. And that's the risk that you're highlighting, right? You, uh... You know, That's the risk that we're highlighting. You, that we are not, we for, yeah. we are not. Comp, we are, the India doesn't isn't compensating for that macro risk, okay. right? You know, okay. if you look at okay. other countries with those kinds of fiscal deficit numbers, current account deficit numbers, their interest rates are much higher. Yeah. Their equity valuation is much lower. Their effect is much lower. Right, right. No, uh, I, I get that. Uh, Jangir, uh, just a, a quick point on uh, the uh, on, on on the U.S. slowdown itself, right? Because that's a that's a big one. Yeah. Because uh, yep. it, it exports out of India, a big one, right? Uh, both services, and but services mm -hmm. more than goods. Uh, so all of that depends yep. on what happens in the US. Is it going to be a sharp, swift one uh, as compared to a kind of a, you know, not so sharp, but a prolonged kind of a phase of recession in the US? And how do, is it important that it is one or the other uh, for the outside world, your sense? No, I mean, clearly, clearly it matters uh, mm. whether or not uh, U.S. goes into a deep recession and when it happens. Mm. Look, we have a baseline in which the, economy, the U.S. economy slows. It's going to run around 1.5% in fourth quarter, fourth quarter, and then it slows down as the impact of the monetary tightening starts biting. We've already seen the impact of the monetary tightening in the housing market. We haven't seen that in the labor market. Uh, and we are, when we are expecting that to play out in 2023, we only have a uh, call for a recession only in the fourth quarter of 23, and that too very mild one that gets extended into the first quarter of 24. So we are of the camp that the amount of monetary tightening that has been done is unlikely to get you to unemployment rates or to the kind of destruction and demand where you will see disinflation fall like a stone and therefore the Fed will be forced to cut much earlier or at least where the market has. 
market is uh, expecting the Fed to start cutting in the second half of the year. We don't think there is any rate cut taking place still in still into uh, until you go into 2024. Uh, so that's our baseline. All right, uh, Jangir, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Great speaking with you as always. Uh, great insights. Thanks very much. Uh, so that's a, a solid perspective right on the top of the program uh, from Jahangir Aziz, uh, top uh, economy man at JP Morgan. We'll take a quick... ...a bit of a give back for our markets. We've been running higher for last eight consecutive days. This morning, the start could be subdued, slightly with a negative bias, down currently 0.3%. But this week itself, the Nifty's rallied 1.6%, while the Sensex is... Uh, the mid-cap index has gained 2.2%. Let's drill it down to individual stocks. A research team is standing by with the CNBC TV18 list of top 10 stocks for the day. Manglam, starting with you, uh, the auto sales numbers which trickled in post-market hours. That's correct. So, filling in for Sonia here, uh, let's start with Aisha Motors. The total uh, sales for Royal Enfield, which is more important for them, were close to around 70,800-odd units. The street was working with a number of around 73,800 units. So there was a mild miss as against street expectations. Total sales on a year-on-year -year basis were higher by 37% as against expectations of over 40% growth out there. However, for Hero Motor Corp, uh, the numbers were absolutely in line with expectations. 3.9 lakh units was the poll of 3.92 lakh units. And this despite a dip in the exports by about 46 odd percent but for them you know the contribution of exports is much lower as against Bajaj Auto to so see some green on Hero Moto a mild red perhaps on Aisha Motors. Yeah all right thanks a lot for that Mangalam. Well uh, let's hop across to Vivek uh, he's stopping by to tell us about PB Fintech there's a large trade that's expected Vivek. Well, good morning. That's right. You know, it's another block deal that's expected as far as PB Fintech or Policy Bazaar. Uh, now, what we understand from our source is that, you know, a block deal of close to almost 1,000 crore rupees, 5.1% uh, of the total equity is expected to sh change hands. Uh, SoftBank, you know, that holds almost 10.1% uh, stake in PB Fintech is the likely seller in this particular block deal. Block deal is expected at a 4.6% discount to yesterday's closing price. So the floor price it is, is at around 440.2 rupees a share. And now remember, SoftBank holds almost 10.17% stake in the company. So they are exiting half their holding. Now, this isn't the first fund that's actually uh, likely to sell shares as far as PB Fintech is concerned. Earlier, you know, once the anchor lock-in ended on November 11, 2022, Tiger Global 2 has significantly paid stake in the company. Tiger Global also holds, uh, you know, stake in the company via two of its funds. Okay, I mean, uh, some of these funds themselves are in a fair bit of a mess, a bit, bit of a uh, you know, uh, pickle, so as to speak, SoftBank especially, uh, and, uh, you know, generating, I guess, revenues and cash wherever they can uh, via uh, older legacy investments. Uh, Vivek, thanks very much for that. Now, there is a windfall tax revision which has happened. Sonal is here to tell us how much and what's the impact. Sonal, hi. Hi, good morning, Prashant. Well, this time it's positive for all these oil producers and Reliance Industries as well. The windfall tax has seen a uh, considerable cut on crude petroleum. It has been halved from 10,200 rupees per ton to 4,900 rupees per ton. On diesel, this export duty has been reduced to 10 uh, to 8 rupees per liter from 10 and half rupees per liter. On petrol, it is continue. It continues to be zero, and ATF uh, export duty continues to be at 5 rupees per liter. Yes, it is a big cut. It is slightly lower than the fall in crude prices that we saw in the last fortnight. CLSA says that cut in windfall tax on domestic crude oil production is $9 per barrel, which compares with $10 per barrel fall that we have seen in crude oil prices. So it's $1 per barrel lesser than uh, what was expected. However, it is still positive for the likes of ONGC and Oil India because the post-tax uh, realization is still kept at $78 per barrel, while these stocks are factoring in oil realizations at uh, $45 to $50 per barrel. So there is a considerable upside still from here on. So that's why these stocks should be in the green today. Sonal, thank you very much for that. The current windfall tax is $8 per barrel, and this compares with $40 per barrel that was announced in June of 2022. Uh, so we've seen a sharp 80% reduction in that. And of course, compared to the prior revision, as Sonal pointed out, it's $8 versus $17. That's a cut of $9. But you're watching NMTC? Well, that's right. Uh, you know, NMTC, uh, the uh, operational update that came wasn't too great, actually. The production number was up by close to 8%, but the sales offtake number, that is, was up only around 55 to around 6%. Also, that was a little bit disappointing, according to me. And they're running behind the clock, actually. You know, uh, year to date, uh, the sales volume is down by close to around 10%. So, It'll be very difficult for them to reach anywhere close to that 45 million tons that they were talking about at the start of it. So a little bit disappointing on that front. And also just want to alert our viewers that yesterday the big news was that the government has invited expression of interest for the Nagarna steel plant. Remember, that's not housed currently in the listed entity. 
that's in the demerge entity that should list in the next couple of months or so. Just note that. And NNBC will be given an option to buy 10% stake. So capital allocation was yet again continue. So, you know, the global setup is quite positive for metals, but maybe NNBC could be a bit of an underperformer because of the weaker than expected operational performance. All right, uh, we'll keep track of that, uh, uh, Nigel, uh, today. Now, Westlife is, uh, should be in focus, uh, and uh, they've laid out, you know, a, a plan for the next five years. Uh, a big ambition. Uh, Magalam, uh, good morning. Good morning. Big ambition. And, you know, if uh, the last couple of plans have uh, something to go by, they go ahead and actually meet it as well, or at least, you know, uh, get very close to it. So that should be a big positive because for 2027, the vision for them is uh, sales of anywhere between 4,000 to 4,500 crores. And remember, FY22 sales was just around 1,500 crores. So that's something that they're looking at. 18 to 20 percent EBITDA margins. FY22, of course, the EBITDA margins were 11.8 uh, odd percent. They target high single digit same store sales growth. 580 to 630 total new restaurants uh, from 337 right now, which implies that 40 to 55 stores would be added every year versus the current run rate of around 23 to 24 odd stores. Importantly, they see long-term potential of over a thousand stores. And Prashant, if you go down south, you would enjoy it because the next leg of growth will come from stores in the southern part of the country and will come in from fried chicken itself. They target 100% of their uh, entire strength to be McCafe as against 80% right now, which would mean that McCafe revenue contribution would increase from 12% to around 15 to 18%. And this, of course, is a margin accretive uh, product for them. So all things uh, going well for the burger player. Let's see where it goes. Uh, Mangalam, our stomachs are growling, uh, as you <laughs> mentioned. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, margin accretive for them, accretive for our stomach and the waistlines as well. Yeah, I think uh, I think Mangalam, by the way, is going to. Uh, there's a treat yeah, due, yeah, right? There's a treat today. There's a treat today. Later today. There's a treat by Mangalam and Sonal. Uh, I think at around 11, 11:30 <laughs> is what we're looking forward to. Well, I've been told that uh, fries are being paid for by me, the burgers, etc. Prashant has been. Uh, kind now of now we've said this on national TV, Mangalam. So I mean, you've got to follow through. <laughs> Done and dusted, I give. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Okay, I've been told that the producers are also uh, looking forward to it. Thanks very much, Mangalam. Uh, <laughs> it's best life uh, for you. Now, uh, Yes Bank and uh, Paytm are the other uh, other ones should, which should be in focus. Paytm, by the way, had that analyst meet, investor meet uh, yesterday in the in, uh, you know in Mumbai, uh, and uh, there is at the margin some optimism which seems to be emerging. Surabhi has got both those on a list. Surabhi, hi, morning. Hi, the first talk on my radar today is Yes Bank, where RBI has given a conditional approval to Carlyle and Advent to pick up 9.9% stake each. The investors and bank will engage with RBI to seek an early resolution on the conditions to procure the final approval. The bank has not mentioned what the conditions are, but overall it seems like a positive uh, news flow for Yes Bank. Next is Paytm, where the company held its analyst meet yesterday and it explained the payment lending business. Um, the company is confident about achieving strong growth and adjusted EBITDA break-even by September 2023. It doesn't see any significant regulation risk to affect it affect its payments margins. The net payment margin should remain broadly steady even if there is a change in MDR, which is merchant discount rate. On credit cards, the management alluded to a significant pickup in business momentum. On commerce business, the management disclosed that the GMV was close to 2,000 crores and the revenue was close to 130 crores. On profitability, it expects to become free cash flow positive in the next 12 to 18 months. Super, thanks for that, uh, Surbhi. Well, uh, let's move on and uh, let's first do a quick recap then of all the stocks that we just covered. Stocks with positive news flow include Hero Motor Corp, West Life, Yes Bank, Paytm, ONGC Oil India and Reliance Industries. All stocks with negative news flow include iChair Motors, PB Fintech and NNBC. Let's uh, take stock of what's happening in the world of commodities. Manisha Gupta joins in as always. Manisha. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm looking at uh, commodities actually trying to post a weekly gain across board, especially with the dollar index now below 105 at a four-month close. So whether it's the crude oil prices, which didn't close November on a positive note, but for the week, they're up by nearly 7%. And the markets are now watching out for the OPEC and Allies meeting. On 4th of December, the European Union has asked its 27 members to approve price cap on Russian oil at $60 a barrel now while the current price of Russian oil is at 66 a barrel. And the proposed cap also comes with an adjustment mechanism to keep the prices 5% below its market prices. A lot expected to happen in the first week of December itself. The metal prices, though, have continued to gain up. Almost all the metals are headed for a weekly gain. 
Copper is trading at around three-week highs, gold at three-month highs, silver at six-month highs. You have zinc, aluminum also posting nearly 7 to 8% of gains this week. So the metal party continues. Back, uh, let's invite uh, Dipan Mehta, Director of Elixir Equities, on the show now. Dipan, yesterday was Paytm's first ever analyst meet. The management explained its business model. They gave insight into their payments and lending business. Uh, did you attend it? Did you have a look at what came out of it? Are you convinced? They are talking about being a free cash flow positive in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, good morning and thank you for having me on your show. I did not attend the Paytm analyst meet. Uh, but yes, I think uh, management has been making all the right uh, comments and the right commentary and their push for profitability is something which the street is looking forward to. But it's just that the business model is still evolving for Paytm and it's not clear how much the payments business will contribute or how much the distribution, financial product distribution business will contribute and what will be the impact of uh, the lending business uh, where they are sourcing loans for NBFCs and banks, how else all of that is going to shape up. And then there was a very important development on 1st of December, the launch of the digital rupee uh, on for uh, for retail uh, users. And that could be a game, if it is successful, it could be a game changer for the payment company. So uh, the yeah. entire environment is uh, very much uh, uncertain. And uh, until we don't get a solid roadmap to uh, profitability and what the numbers are looking three, four years down the line, I would just like to uh, wait and watch as far as Paytm is concerned. There are other new digital platform companies which have a more uh, specific and a clearer uh, roadmap as to their business model and, and uh, when they will touch profitability. I think one could focus over there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> fair enough. Uh, you know, I guess what's happening is in all these names, uh, Deepan, and uh, tell me otherwise if you think so, in PB Fintech, in Paytm, uh, you know, prices have uh, come off so much that uh, you, you, you're you getting a it's possible that you get a, a clean, very fast 20-30% kind of uh, moves higher, right? Uh, which could be trading bounces. Even PB Fintech, where we know, I mean, we had the IRDI uh, chief uh, t uh, telling us that their, their plan is to make Bhima Sugam into a, uh, I mean, it should be a UPI moment for insurance. So the intention is clearly to be disruptive. But even if it is disruptive, it is still a year away. Uh, and a year is a long time, right? Uh, with prices so beaten down. Go on. Yeah, Prashant, good morning. Uh, see, I know that they want to create an insurance platform. Mm. Uh, and if you, uh, you may like to know that BSE also has a mutual fund platform, okay? But end of the day, insurance like mutual funds has to be sold. And for selling that, I think that's where PB FinTech comes into play. It's not insurance, nothing you can just go out and buy. You need a lot of handholding and advice and there's documentation and there are various other factors to be considered and uh, the right insurance policy has to be identified. So I don't think that PB FinTech's business model is going to be impacted by such a platform. Nevertheless, you're right. I think the way the stock prices of these new age digital companies has collapsed, they are reaching a point uh, where a significant bottom could be created. End of the day, Prashant, let's keep in mind that these are outstanding businesses. And it's just uh, the valuation, which is a bit of a mystery how to get around that. But with these kind of corrections, uh, I think the risk return will favor the investor who takes a slightly contrarian view and invest in these stocks with a longer term horizon, maybe beyond even five years or so. Because these companies have a very long runway for growth and they can, even five years from now, they can continue to grow at uh, high double digit, uh, high teens growth rates. And when they turn profitable at that point of time, uh, the street will give significantly higher PE multiples. So, it's an evolving situation, but intuitively, I do feel that uh, maybe a bottom has got created. And uh, from this point on, assuming that the commentary and the numbers are positive, uh, you could see these companies uh, deliver a sharp turnaround. Dipan, good morning. Good to speak to you again. Dipan, uh, the cement sector, you know, that's bounced back. November was a good month in terms of demand. October was a bit weakish. So I'll have to point out that that... November data point is coming on a week base because the festive season last year was in November. That said, things are looking up because input costs have cooled off as well. What's your take on this space and how would you play it? Would you stick to the big daddy, that's Altitec Cement, or would you go for the mid-cap names or maybe ACC Ambuja? I think every bounce in cement is a good selling opportunity. Maybe the best years for cement companies are behind them. The way they are expanding capacity uh, I'm sure that the pricing discipline of the past several years, maybe decades, may get vitiated. 
you have a large new player coming in wanting to disrupt wanting to expand capacity the minute they have announced their acquisition and completed it every single cement company has announced even higher expansion plans and it's not that uh, you know the the cost uh, costs are going to go down significantly even if they do pricing pressure will come into play and volumes may certainly go up but even then i don't think the profitability of these companies is going to um, improve the way it has over the past so i'd like to avoid cement completely uh, if you still want to buy a cement stock then go with the biggest one the last largest two ones that is shri cement and ultratech i think they have a fabulous track record even during uh, difficult times of the industry and you could have a marginal allocation over there but by and large this is the time to buy cement consumers the real estate companies the infrastructure companies the engineering construction companies i think you'll get higher returns over there than in cement and other material companies okay got it uh, pretty clear with your view out there dipan uh, dipan requests you to stay with us for just a bit we're going to come back to you but for the time being let's get chatting with the management of cosmo films the stock is up close to 20% in just 5 days remember yesterday they announced a buyback and they'll be spending close to 108 crores on this buyback to understand more about that we're joined by mr pankaj podar who joins us on the show hi pankaj good morning good to speak to you as always well uh, give us a couple of details you know we have most of it in your press release that the promoter entity is going to participate in this buyback as well but you're going to fund this via internal uh, resources you know from the cash flows that will generate how is your balance sheet looking as of now what is the you know cash net debt that you have in books and you've also stated that this will help improve the roe and roce what is the targeted roe and roce yeah hi everyone so this will be uh, done through internal accruals or debt as on date is 350 crores while our ebitda numbers for the last year was 600 plus crores uh, so we are sitting at a very comfortable balance sheet and uh, the board has always believed in giving the right returns to the shareholders so this is in line with that and obviously when the overall equity comes down then the return on equity numbers and return on capital uh, employed always looks better uh, the last year both these numbers were hovering at uh, 25 30% and uh, you know uh, so obviously we intend to maintain uh, in in similar ranges All right, uh, Pankaj. Uh, you know you're already sitting on a debt of around 350 crores, and you have some capex plans, right? You're going to be putting up a specialty chemicals, a uh, specialty division, uh, 60 crores out there. Films as well. You're expanding. So your total capex, I think, is in the range of around 600 crores. That's what, right. What would the peak debt be for the company? Um, you're, you're at 350 crores. What does it go to? Keeping in mind this capex. Yes, yeah, so see, we will be generating cash everywhere. Uh, this uh, this new capex that you're talking about will happen till March 25, uh, which is still two and a half years from now. So we'll be generating cash, and uh, the generated cash will be enough to pay for these capex. So effectively, we will be staying at uh, close to 450, 500 crores uh, till March 25, and uh, then unless we do not do any further capex, uh, we will be uh, cash, uh, uh, you know, zero uh, debt. Uh, maybe in March twenty six, that will be five hundred crores. Yeah, and debt free by March twenty twenty six. That's right. All right. Uh, you know, um, in Q two or in fact in the first half of the year, you faced a lot of raw material headwinds, uh, inflationary pressures. Your operating margins in the first half of the year were seventeen percent, which compares with over twenty percent same time last year. Can you give us an update on how margins are trending and the inflation that you're facing? Yes. Yeah, so, see, what really is impacting many of the businesses which export is that typically, you know, a lot of customers globally were buying more goods from January till June because the supply chains were impacted. Now, typically, what happened is that post July onwards, uh, the supply chain got better, the logistics time got reduced, or something which, let's say, for US was taking seventy-five days uh, during this interim period, went back to thirty days. and therefore all these customers which because of supply chain they had increased their stocks and all of a sudden the uh, transit time went down so two things happened at the same time and everybody got into the rush of reducing the stock so quarter 3 and uh, i would say quarter 2 and quarter 3 had uh, quite a substantial impact for exports not being at the numbers that uh, were expected but we feel that from january onwards still be uh, things will be largely back on track obviously there is some impact of russia ukraine war in europe specifically but largely speaking uh, things will be back in shape from january when it comes to exports as such <clears throat> pankaj hi good morning 
You know, before the buyback, I remember maybe 15, 20 days back, uh, before you announced the buyback, I was speaking with a uh, investor, a long-time investor in your company, was, of course, lamenting the share price performance, but uh, was keeping the faith, especially, and he was most excited about the pet care business, uh, which you've yeah. uh, told us before as well. And, you know, he was giving us comparisons of how large a business that is in the U.S. and, you know, what potentially could come off it. You're, of course, in very, very early stages of, uh, you know, what uh, the, of, of building that out, really. Uh, any any further updates in terms of how you can, uh, you know, uh, just a, a brief update on how that is progressing and uh, is there any way you can uh, fa fasten the process of building that out? So, see, uh, I do see a lot of uh, fresh startups do, uh, you know, speed up the process by burning a lot of money. Mm. Uh, you know, we are doing it more fundamentally correct and we are not in a hurry to, you know, just give excessive discounts and, uh, buy sales at any cost. That is not the philosophy that we belong to. Mm -hmm. Within 15 months, we have already reached a run rate of close to 15 crores per annum sales. And month on month, we are making progress. Every month, there is a 10, 15, 20% sales from the previous month. And we are pretty happy with that because from last year to this year, uh, I mean, last year, obviously, we did uh, six months and this year, we are eight months. And we're already sizably up from uh, last year. And it's a process, uh, you know, we want to make sure that everything that we do uh, is correct. And at the same time, you know, uh, we are into the entire ecosystem. Uh, we are not uh, something where uh, we are just looking at one piece of it. So we are building products, we are building services, we are building our own brands, and we are into retail and online both. So we have taken quite a task, uh, you know, uh, uh, with, within the company. And uh, within a short span, we have a team of now 150 people. And the way we are growing, uh, you know, we are going to create one of the largest pet care business in India in the times to come. Is there, uh, Pankaj, is there anyone uh, who's heading this, by the way? I mean, because I'm assuming this is a specialized, someone with, have you got someone who's done this before? Uh, who's, who's kind of driving this? Yes, yeah, so you're absolutely correct. For all our businesses, we have business heads. And similarly, for pet care business, there's a business head, Tamrish, who had come from earlier, who had worked in the pet care industry for ages. And then for last two years, he's the first employee of uh, Zigli, and he is driving the entire growth for this business. Okay, all right. Uh, Pankaj, uh, your uh, specialty and semi-specialty toge together is around 64%, as per your last presentation, right? Split it up yeah. between both these two. How much is specialty? How much is semi-specialty? Because there's a spread margin difference between those as well. So a rough breakup of the 64%. Yes, so speciality is hovering at 37, 38% okay. and uh, the rest is semi-speciality. Got it. All right. So 37 and 27 approximately. Got that. Uh, also, you have a, uh, you know, a BOPET line that is going to be commissioned in the second half of this year. I think you put in around 450 crores, right, in that. Uh, what, yes. is, what is the asset turn expected from here? So, see, we have already commissioned the line at September end. Okay. And, uh, you know, obviously the timing was not good because polyester had a lot of new lines coming up at the same time. But what we had actually purposely brought this line was more for speciality films. We want to do window films in India. We want to do graphic films. Uh, we want to do security films. Uh, we are also at the same time looking at shrink labels. So, these are very specialized markets that we are going to address. Uh, I would say the line is already up and running, but our batch plan for making the necessary raw material got delayed because of, again, the supply chain uh, problems that we are facing all around the world. So that should also be up and running uh, by March. And similarly, the window film line should be up and running by March. Uh, so we will be scaling up in a phased manner, and uh, our target is within the next three to five years. Majority of this line would be completely dedicated to speciality uh, products and where the margins are much, much better uh, than the uh, fluctuating margins of the commodity side. Pankaj, we leave it at that. Thank you very much for joining us and talking about your buyback, your plans for the pet care business, as well as the chemicals business. That's Cosmo first for you. The stock is down 40% so far this year and down more than 60% from its 52-week high. Dipan Mehta is still with us. Dipan, any thoughts on Cosmo first? Yeah, you know, I'm perplexed with the correction in stock prices. I think last four or five years, the performance has improved significantly. And it's a dominant player in the film business. And they're getting into every single film that uh, they think they have the capacity and the technology to manufacture. There's a huge overseas market also, which benefits from China plus one uh, strategy of uh, global MNCs. Valuation is also extremely attractive. Now there's a buyback also underway. My sense is that it's uh, clearly a value play. And it's just a matter of time before uh, you know it, it moves up by maybe a quarter, 25% or so 
for the next six to 12 months. So once we are in a full blown bull market, I think these stocks do tend to get discovered or rather rediscovered again. And uh, even small amount of uh, buying can lift the stock prices higher considering the low level of liquidity in such uh, small mid cap stocks. Mm. You know, uh, Rima, the, uh, the, the core business specialty films, et cetera, yeah. of course, is the core of the business. But it's got a, it's got soft power, right? You know, which are the v videos on YouTube which do the best? They are uh, cute dog and cute cat videos. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they've got soft power going here. Of course, it's a real business as well, and it's uh, it's very small right now. Uh, but uh, we talk about new age companies, right? New kinds of companies coming to the business. Here's an old age company attempting something new, uh, and uh, you know, uh, we'll see. Uh, the business potential is huge, right? Absolutely. All pet owners spend so much money taking them to spas, salons, for Absolutely. you know hair washes. I, I am a, a pet, pet <laughs> owner, so I, I, it's it's uh, it is big business. It's yeah. a you know it's it's a it's a big one. We'll take a quick uh, break here on the other side. Shrikant Johan will be with us, and Mitesh. Hope you're having a good Friday morning. Well, our technical experts are with us. Mitesh Chakar as well as Shrikant Johan join in. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Hope it's a cracking start to the day. But the SJX would be suggesting that we're likely to pull back a little bit, 40 to around 50 points. Mitesh, morning, you go first. Uh, what do you think? Uh, buy the dip immediately or wait for a deeper gash? Uh, good morning, guys. I think immediately I wouldn't want to buy a 40, 50 point kind of a dip. The, uh, because of the run up in the last few days, uh, the supports on the intraday charts also plays around 18,670, 660 marks. So I think you, know, you still have. A bit more to go in case you want to uh, get a favorable reserve equation. Uh, around 18,700, 720, maybe with a 50, 60 point kind of a stop, you would want to see if there's some support coming in some other, some stocks, uh, especially the large caps are making fresh moves on the upside. Then you would want to buy. So markets are overbought. Markets are slightly stretched from the uh, intraday averages on the uh, two hourly charts as well. So I think I would wait it out. But the directional bias remains positive because. Uh, this in, even if there's a mild gap down and, and uh, slight follow through, it'll be more, more of a pullback uh, to the rally which we have seen for the last few days. All okay. right, Srikanth, what about you? How would you approach trade today? Good morning, Nigel. Good morning, everyone. I think this uh, technical rally is going to continue because the market has broken important crucial level of 18,600 after a period of almost 13 months. So it is going to continue, but the strategy should be to buy on dips. If there is any correction uh, close to 18,750 or 18,700, then there we should be buyer with a stop loss at 18,600. We are expecting market to hit the levels of 19,000 very soon. And for the bank nifty, there also we have a bullish view. But uh, yesterday, on Thursday, we saw breakout in IT index and it has validated double bottom formations. So which will, in fact, add some more uh, fuel to the overall entire up move of the market. Okay, uh, Srikanth, uh, good morning. Uh, what would your trades be? Good morning, Prashant. I think we should look for uh, adding some IT companies uh, to our uh, trading portfolio because there we are expecting con consistency uh, in the uh, some bullish reversal patterns. Uh, we are of the view that we should be buyer in Tech Mahindra at current levels uh, with a target of 1160, 1170 on the higher side. We can keep stop loss around 1080 for the same. We also like uh, Muthut Finance, which is around 1110, and it is again correlating with the rise in the gold prices. There we are expecting stock to move towards 1200. Here we can keep stop loss somewhere close to 1060. And finally, uh, cement companies, there also we need to focus because a uh, number of companies did extremely well in yesterday's trading session. So in that space, we like India Cement. Uh, there we are expecting stock to move towards 260. We can keep stop loss somewhere close to 243. Okay, all right, got that, Shrikant. Mitesh, what about you, individual stocks? Yeah. Uh, on the stock side, uh, I have more of buy calls today. Uh, Grassi is a buy with a stop at 1770 for targets of 1860. Indalco was a buy uh, yesterday as well, even now can be bought afresh. On a mild dip, say, pull back to about levels of 458, 459. Keep a stop below 450. Look for targets of 475 and a buy on DLF with a stop at 406 half for targets of 425. The solitary sell call is BEL, which could see some profit booking. Uh, sell with a very tight stop at 105 half for targets of 101. Okay, get into a short break on that note. Uh, stay on, gentlemen. We'll also come back with the pre opening rate and we'll be joined by Basudev Banerjee of ICSA Securities to discuss the November auto sales.